All right. Um, okay, I'm here with uh, Jane Hammond, her um, documentary Cry of the Forests is being screened for the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. It's headed to competition at Cinema Nova on the 24th, I do believe. 25th, Sunday the 25th. Okay, yes, my mistake. Anyway, um, before we get, get, get into the inter interesting things, um, what have people might have, where have people might have seen your work before? Um, yeah, I was at the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival a couple of years ago with my other film, Accrued Injustice. Uh -huh. um, so I've been in Melbourne before with that one, um, which is now on Beamer Film and on Vimeo On Demand. With Cry of the Forest, it's um, been screening um, in Western Australia quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just heading over east. We've, um, it's, it's screened once in Sydney. Um, but uh, and once in Geelong at a festival down there in the Gecko Festival. Uh -huh. um, uh, and um, yeah, Cry of the Forest is available on fa via the Fan for Cinema on Demand platform. Uh -huh. um, so that's probably the easiest way to catch it, and other than the, the festival. And basically, for that, all you have to do is ask you ask fa Fan Force to ask your cinema to screen it at your local cinema. For those people who don't know. Anyway, yep. um, getting into the the interesting part uh, for this documentary. Uh, for this interview, uh, what inspired Cry of the Forests? Yeah, Cry of the Forests is about the plight of Western Australia's forests and the real value in drawing down and storing carbon. Um, and um, yeah, I, I came to this story in 2019. I was asked by the WA Forest Alliance to do some celebrity interviews um, about the, the value of forests for climate. Um, and the role that they play, which is, wasn't even really being acknowledged by the climate movement. There was a, a big focus on fossil fuel, mm -hmm. stopping fossil fuels and things like Adani, which is absolutely vital. But at the other side of the equation, we also look, need to look at what we're doing to forests worldwide. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has acknowledged that, that this is a really important part of the equation. Um, so I started uh, looking into what, what was happening and, and became very aware very quickly that, um, you know, there was a really big story here that we had been, as West Australians, really missing. Um, I, I started in environmental activism at the age of 14 because of the forest issue. And I assumed, like so many other West Australians by 2000, when the Labor government came in, that we'd solved the forest issue, that we had um, protected old growth forests, but actually we haven't. And we no longer just need to protect old growth forests. We now, because of the climate emergency that we now face, we need to protect all forests that we have left, all native forests. Um, and during the filming, it became evident as well that we are actually uh, doing this, the taxpayers are funding this loss making industry. That so it absolutely, yep, makes no sense. Shock, one of the biggest shocks of the movie, um, you know, you're, here, you, you're supposed to invest in something where you know that you know there's a need and, and a profit, and the WA state government isn't doing that, and that's kind of, in my mind, is a good enough reason to tell them to stop doing it, um, because they're squeezing people out of the industry and affecting so much else. Um, yeah, it, it's just such a wasteful industry, and these forests aren't being used for fine furniture. Just 15% of, of, the, of the forest that's cut goes into usable timber. The uh -huh. rest goes into wood chips, firewood, and charcoal. And this is just to, just to uh, give people a point of ge geographical reference. The forests in Western Australia that you're talking about are between Albany and, and Perth, if I remember rightly. More or less in that, yeah, it's a sort of a little bit squishier than that, but that far um, southwest corner of Western Australia is where we find our Jarrah forests, mostly along along the, the scarp behind Perth, going all the way into the wheat belt, and uh, the Carry forests, which are sort of behind Margaret River, Pemberton, um, um, and and along a beautiful strip uh, along the south coast where we have the Valley of the Giants. Um, so they, yeah, they're they're really spectacular forests. Absolutely beautiful. Well, there there was some you know 
brilliant footage and I, I actually kind of enjoyed some of the towards the end of the documentary some of the footage you got of the animals in the forest I thought yep. that was kind of touching the you know with everything else that was uh, discussed in the documentary um what exact well what exactly can audiences sort of expect expect from the documentary yeah it's a uh, well a cinematic journey really to um I, ma I made this film so people could remember western australians and beyond that um these forests are absolutely stunning i wanted west australians to fall in love with the forest again and to want to save it um so um yeah they can expect um a journey through our forest to meet some of the activists that are putting everything on the line to protect these forests. Um, we hear from scientists, um, uh, the beekeeping industry and ecotourism industries that are impacted by this logging. And we hear from plantation owners who can't sell their products because basically they're, uh, they're competing against the government uh, in trying to sell their wood. Yeah, they're getting squeezed out of the industry, which was a, another weird thing I uh, thing I thought. Um, has there been any have you have, <laughs> has there been any comment on your documentary from either the uh, state government uh, and I, or I do believe it, uh, the mining company who was mining bauxite was Adani? No, Alcoa, American Illumina company, Alcoa. But we that's just one of the companies. But we look at specifically at Alcoa because they want to expand more of their bauxite mining. And what, what they do is that, and they've been doing this for nearly 60 years, is they take the uh, lateritic um, bauxite rock from underneath the Northern Jarra Forest, uh, strip that out in strip mining and, and replant it. Um, and initially they were doing that with blue gums in straight rows, but community pressure has meant that they now try to revegetate with the native species, but we're never going to see the forest as we had it because the bauxite, although it's a rock, plays this amazing sponge-like role in, in the ecosystem and stores the water that helps the Jarrah thrive. When you take that out of the system, they're basically just in, you know, a little bit of loose rocks and sand. Uh -huh. um, and we have got this drying climate. So I, you see in the film an example of 100 years of, of forest regrowth. And the trees are like this. They're this big. You could wrap your hands around them. They're so spindly. And yet our Jarrah forests of the past were, you know, could fit across this room. Um, so we, yeah, we've really taken so much out. And what, what is left, I, I believe we really need to, to preserve for biodiversity and climate. And well, that's going to take a lot of change with uh, getting the mi mining companies out of uh, Australia. <laughs> well, I mean, there are plenty of other places that they could be mining um, the, you know, the, the, the basic um, components for alumina. They don't need to take it out from underneath the only Jarrah forest in the world particularly when you look at how valuable that forest is for our climate, for our water resources, and for our biodiversity. We've got well, so many threatened species in Western Australia. Yes. Um, and, yeah, and yet this is continuing and it's, it doesn't have to happen. We're not, we're not digging out diamonds here or gold. We're, we're drink, digging out something that's quite common that there is a lot of other places that have, um, you know, sources of alumina. Um, and we can also do a lot more recycling. You know, we, why should we dig up a Jarrah forest to make a tin can? You know, well, it's, it's true, crazy. especially with the, you know, ten, ten cent refund coming in in most states for re recycled bottles and cans. Yep. Yeah, we've got that in Western Australia now, and you can see immediately that that is cleaned up. Like I, I've just been down our local oval, and it's just littered with all this other stuff, but there isn't a bottle or can to be seen because now they've, we've given those an economic value and people are coming in and they're cleaning them up. Yeah, well, um, kids get, get an extra source of in, uh, pocket money or something. Yeah, uh, and it's not only kids, yeah. True. Um, was there anything, while filming, was there anything that you th sort of uh, found to be particularly challenging about, about, about well, yeah, well, really I'm sure what I'm getting, well, anything particularly challenging that you discovered? Um, yeah, I mean, we were filming through COVID, but, you know, we have a very small team. Sometimes it was just me. 
Um, so that that wasn't too much of an issue in Western Australia. We've we've been quite lucky. We've had not as many lockdowns, and we've got quite a lot of freedom of movement between regions as soon as the lockdowns lifted. Um, the biggest problem with making this film was we had so much footage, and it's so high quality, 4K and above. Oh. Um, so I just didn't have the computer power to to really. Uh, Put it together because I also edited it myself um, and brought in at the end I brought in a polish editor but um, I had to build it in pieces because my uh, hardware just wasn't up to the job um, and and in the end I had to borrow a high-powered computer from a friend to finish it off so there were those sorts of technical issues but in actually making this film um, I got so much support from the community um, we got, you know, crowdfunding. We crowdfunded the entire thing. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it it, um, it it was a joy to make. It really was. Although it was depressing seeing the forest fall, uh -huh. um, it was yeah very rewarding making this film. It, was there anything sort of uh, that surprised you about the process of making this film? Um, I guess the um, the extent of the damage that's happening to our forest surprised even me. And the more I looked into it, the more devastating it became and the more wasteful and, and out, you know, the, the stupidity of it became really rammed itself home. So that was, yeah, that, that's what I found amazing about making this film is, I mean, there was also really positive things too, like the connectivity that still exists with the cultural custodians of the forest regions. That, that was a, a, an eye opener for me, for somebody who's, spent so much time in the forests and yet I didn't know the real cultural story behind them. So that was- A lot yeah, of was... what they had to say was, was rather interesting. And I must admit the whole, the footage that you had of the logging definitely doesn't sort of uh, hold to what, how you would think a uh, forest or, you know, trees cut down or anything, which was, which is a bit of a shock to the system. Um, sort of uh, se seemed to be more, more sort of they, they really didn't care what they were doing and just sort of going on a rampage through the forest with the machinery as rather than uh, taking care in what, what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the issues. You've got contractors and often they're not even from those areas just coming in with these big machines and they're kind of un unfettered access. And it was only the that we had these amazing uh, volunteers going out with GoPros and hiding in the forest and capturing this footage, um, unbeknownst to the loggers. With they'd sometimes be within meters of these huge machines, um, and they're capturing this this devastation. But also, if you go there on the weekend afterwards and you just see everything flattened, logs that will never be used, acacias and, and grass trees that have stood for hundreds and hundreds of years have just been flattened. Um, it's, it's just, it breaks your heart, it really does. The best way to describe it is almost like a three-year-old having a temper tantrum with their blocks, the way, the way these machines go through. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, well, I think that is all the questions that I have. So, well, what we, what, what I guess the last thing to say, say is Cry of the Forests is be, being screened at a Cinema Nova on the 25th. And if, and if you can't get and see it with the, in Melbourne because of lockdown or whatever, be sure to check out and, or, uh, th through FanForce at, and to get, try and get it, show it some love to get it to your cinema because you know what is saving these forests even if you're not the most environmentally minded person in the world it is a very important thing to try and do and absolutely and we have a wrap around social impact campaign associated with this film we've got a list of things that people can do to help save the forests um, including um, writing to the minister and filling in a postcard. We have um, postcards and um, yeah, a whole lot of things that people can do. And we're also in schools. We've got the film into schools and there's a comprehensive education package um, that uh, has just been released on the education shop site. Well, thank you very much for your time, Jane. 
Thank you.